Uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm a bit um, coming just right after a cold, so I'm going to speak quite quietly uh, just to protect my voice at the moment. Um, it's terrific to be here, uh, and I think it's fantastic that the State Library is putting on a forum like this. Um, I'm going to start today just giving you some context of the sort of the different hats that I wear because um, I don't think I fit probably anywhere nicely within <laughs> the system. I'm sort of between the gaps uh, all over the place. Uh, um, and I think primarily in relation to this, um, I've been working as an oral historian now for not that long, probably only about five or six years. Uh, but um, I've worked on the, uh, probably the biggest project, one of the biggest projects that I worked on early on was a project called the Talking Fish Project. And that was um, this kind of strange alliance between <laughs> Uh, Queensland Fisheries, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, which was uh, shortly to implode um, because there was a lot of political pressure on the MDBA at that time, uh, and the ABC. And they were all sort of working together. And the ABC, from my end, uh, was about the dissemination of material. Uh, but um, the, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and Queensland Fisheries, and also a university were involved in the collection of the material. And the whole idea of that was around <coughs> um, the preservation of knowledge around the freshwater fisheries, which start off in Queensland right through to the Coorong. And so I was involved in uh, collecting the oral histories down there and asking people what their old time knowledge was, what their connection with the river systems were. Uh, and um, uh, we were primarily interested in getting that information back out to the community in a bid to um, better inform people about um, just how incredibly uh, damaged the system was. Uh, and of course the fishermen had a lot of that knowledge. The fishermen, the fisher people, the families that lived on the rivers, the changes they'd seen over the many years. Uh, and it was, it was a beautiful project for me, beautiful project, I loved it. Um, um, it, was, it was kind of quite a weird beast actually because on the one hand I was working with on the one hand, I was working with a university who was very duty-bound to work with ethical clearance uh, and, um, and, and there was a certain amount of sort of quantifying of information that was going on with the scientists from things like the Murray-Darling Basin. But on the other hand, they wanted to get this stuff out. And I was kind of caught in between. I think if I'd just been an oral historian or if I'd just been a radio producer, I think it probably would have been a bit easier. But I was sort of straddling two kind of worlds there. And of course the world of a radio producer is quite different than the world of an oral historian. And the consent form um, doesn't often marry the purposes of that. Uh, and I think what became really obvious to me was that um, uh, universities by default will be very um, risk averse. Uh, and so they'll kind of close things down and the consent forms will be very, very complicated. Whereas for the likes of producing stuff for radio uh, and getting stuff out there, um, we needed a certain freedom. Uh, I didn't want people sitting on my shoulders while I was editing a piece for radio. It was just impossible. Uh, but anyway, we produced this piece here um, among a, a raft of different pieces. And this one was for Hindsight, which is for Radio National. And that was a 50 minute feature here, which um, drew a lot off the oral history. But I'll, I'll just kind of say actually here, there's an interesting kind of, there's an interesting situation here, I think, with producing something, say, for radio that comes out of oral history. And I think um, it would have been interesting to have had a conversation with Alistair about this, because what you've got is you've got a whole lot of primary material that doesn't necessarily kind of form a story in itself. So how do you actually create a story from a whole lot of material that's about forming a collection? And I think with something like the Australian Generations, um, uh, I think it's Jennifer Bowen who's doing the, the, um, the actual production for the stories. 
my understanding is they're generally bringing in experts. They're bringing in an expert, which would be an academic, to kind of weave the narrative through. And then they'll have this oral history piece, this oral history piece, this oral history piece, this oral history piece. As a radio producer, I have a bit of a problem with that. And I feel that it's actually more um, important for me, as a kind of an artist and a storyteller, to actually use primarily the oral history people's voices and maybe even pick out one which best represents the whole of them and then use that as a kind of narrative arc to take us from the beginning and the end. Because as soon as you bring in this expert, then it's suddenly almost kind of becoming a sort of a preachy thing, I find, personally. So in something like this Talking Fish, I only used the material that I collected uh, as a sort of a, I sort of felt duty bound in some ways to do this. So that's the first thing. Uh, I've also worked on the Forgotten Australians project with the National Library, which was an extremely professional project. It's probably the most uh, powerful and um, uh, well-run oral history project I've ever been involved in. Uh, and that was with kids who had been put into institutions. Uh, and it kind of straddled, you know, from things like the stolen generation right through to um, uh, the child migrants. Uh, but generally, I think you could probably say it was poor white kids who were sort of dumped into institutions, generally. Uh, and very powerful stuff. Now, I actually said to Kevin Bradley from the National Library when I was doing this, I said, Kevin, it's great going in here as an oral historian, but I've made friends with a whole lot of really pivotal people here. Why don't we get them talking together? Instead of me coming in as an expert, as the oral historian expert, why don't we actually get them talking together? Why don't we get James Luthy and, you know, Clem Apted, who were both in the same home together, why don't we get them having a bit of a yarn and talking about, you know, the different risks they took or the games they played or the food they ate or the punishment they took. And, and that creates a completely different oral history matrix. But unfortunately I think it was a little bit left of field for the State Library to, to sort of undertake um, and, and they weren't prepared to do it. But I think if you're looking at something like getting the material out there and informing the people of what happened in these institutions that's a very powerful way, because when we listen to those voices of those two people talking and there's a familiarity, there's a common experience, it's a very different register than me going in as an expert oral historian who's done some research and background and interviewing one person. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the Forgotten Australian Project was fantastic. I loved working on it and it was a real honour. Uh, and the latest one that I've been working on is the Australian Generations Project with Al Thompson, which I believe you're all kind of familiar with. Okay, so um, I actually came to oral history because I was doing a lot of, I guess you would say, social history through radio. So I was working with um, things like um, uh, 360, uh, um, uh, Radio Eye, uh, Hindsight uh, with Radio National. And so I, I kind of it was a very easy sort of transition for me to make from radio through to oral history because I really enjoyed working with people. Um, I, I love working with people actually. I really, I really love hearing people's stories. It really, I really get off on it. Um, and, um, and everyone's got such interesting stories and I don't know, people tell me things. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting. And I'm not shy. I'm not shy about asking people things. You know, if, if, if that relationships there, if that trust is there, if that, if that rapport is there, um, I feel really very comfortable in that situation. Uh, and um, I never invite people to disclose things that they, they don't want to disclose, but um, um, the, the oral history thing is an interesting contract, isn't it? I mean, you've got... Um, an exchange taking place, and yet there's this microphone there. So it's, it's both a sort of personal exchange, uh, and, and, and that's built on trust and respect and, and um, an understanding, and that, that, that the contract's kind of established. But on the other hand, it's part of a collection. <laughs> 
and the collections deemed significant or their conversations deemed important or for some reason we're recording this because there's some bigger reason. Um, and, and, and that conversation's an interesting sort of balancing act between those two. Uh, and um, and I, I find that curious. I find it a sort of an interesting dance uh, in terms of the interplay uh, between myself and, and people who I'm working with. And I think Al, Al's very good at that. I think uh, he's got a very good um, uh, approach to, to working with people. Um, and um, the Australian Generation's been a, a terrific project to work on. It'd be very interesting to see what, what comes out of it. Uh, and I really believe that they're, they're really making a big effort not only to, to digitise the collection so that it's as accessible broadly to the public as possible, but they're also looking at, at, at outcomes from out of this. Um, so my background before I was doing oral history was, was in radio, working as a freelancer. Um, uh, trying to eke out a living uh, as a radio producer and before that was, was as a writer. I came to um, Queensland on a scholarship to the University of Queensland and um, sort of went into a slight meltdown actually um, and realised that, um, that probably writing wasn't for me. But I, I went from writing and I went into radio with the strong sense of voice, of narrative, of story. And I think what that did is it equipped me with a great awareness of the tools that are available to you as a producer to craft a story that gets people in. And it's not to fabricate, it's not to muck around with people's stuff, it's not to be gratuitous with story, but my sense is often we don't have a sense how to tell our own story. We know it's kind of there and if you listen carefully and if you sort of develop a good relationship with the person then you can take parts of that and create a story which almost kind of captures what they're trying to say and it gets it out there. And I think in that process something very different happens. And um, so, so that's one example of, of talking fish um, that I was involved in. Another example um, that I was involved in. Um, so uh, probably about six years ago um, I worked with a woman who uh, recently committed suicide. Uh, her name was Carmel. Uh, she lived on the streets uh, for a long time in Brisbane and um, uh, she, um, um, she, um, she was part of an organisation called A Place to Belong in West End and um, what, it, it's kind of hard to explain, it was this, it was this collection, it was this sort of recording of, of material with her and then from out of there we wanted to kind of look at the way West End was changing because at that time West End was kind of on the cusp of moving through to you know becoming the latest and best place in, in Brisbane and development was happening. And so this radio program I guess sort of explored that kind of social history of the changes that have happened in West End and, um, and the way in which people make sense of their community through familiar landmarks. Uh, now from out of this also uh, came um, a variety of, of different things. Um, one of them was um, we animated uh, a boarding house uh, down the road at 17 Browning Street, uh, just down here, and the boarding house had been operational since I think the 1930s. And we, we got a whole lot of actors actually, we got a, um, a, a, a troop of kind of actors from an Aboriginal uh, acting school here in, somewhere in Brisbane and we plonked them in different rooms and we basically used characters who we knew had been in that boarding house and we got them to basically just animate the place. We had cricket from the 1950s on on the radio and we planted all these sounds around the house. And then meanwhile we used material from some of the stuff and we, we, we basically created, I suppose, sort of like a, um, 
I don't know, it's like a, it's, we sort of animated it. Um, and we produced a lot of those stuff, the, the, the sounds that we had with, with Radio National, Radio National Revolved. Um, and it was, it was beautiful, but it primarily kind of came out of this journey with Carmel. Carmel knew the streets here in West End so well. And, um, and uh, it, it's funny actually, just talking about it, I sort of um, feel a little bit sorry really, because she walked into the river about a year and a half ago. Um, so, um, the other hat that I wear today in talking to you is um, as a, um, what am I, a director, <laughs> a founder, co-founder, a co-founder of this project and it's called The Story Project. And The Story Project um, came out of um, a conversation that I had with uh, a good friend of mine at Radio National around um, a project in America. And the story project basically sort of takes oral history and it sort of moves it slightly to the right or to the left. It moves it slightly kind of off to the side. And it places the emphasis more on the exchange between people, people who know each other, people who've got a common experience, people who have lived their entire lives together. And what it says is that your exchange is no better than your exchange, is no better than your exchange. So, um, for example, we worked in the Sunshine Coast and I think we recorded around 100 and something, um, and people would come in together. They would come in in partners, mother, son, husband, wife, uh, grandmother, granddaughter, um, all sorts of, you know, guys who'd worked in forestry for years together. And we gave them a 40 minute slot. And we sat them down in a, in a reasonably kind of controlled environment. We asked them to, um, we told them what would happen with the material. Uh, we, we tried to be as clear as possible. We said the, the objective of this is to um, record uh, documents, conversations from around this region, to then archive them as professionally as we can, and then to, um, to uh, to provide material um, so that the stories are heard as broadly as possible. Um, and um, I think we're, we're kind of probably the only people in Australia who are sort of exploring this model. So, um, you know, for example, here's Malachi Colloy. He grew up in Samoa, uh, was it Tonga, um, in the 30s. Um, and this is him talking with his granddaughters. And it's really quite an extraordinary conversation because he's, he's sharing kind of generational knowledge and he's doing it in a way which is sort of natural for him and his family. So you, you're not getting this expert kind of coming in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what it's like to grow up in Tonga or somewhere in the, the, the 30s. I wouldn't have any idea. But when I hear him talk with his granddaughters, his eyes light up and, and you know, he's, he's really, they love him, his granddaughters love him. So you've kind of not only captured something which is deemed worthy of a collection, but you've also captured an exchange which is almost, you know, sometimes very genuine. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it can be a bit forced. Sometimes it can be a bit sort of put on. But often people really are kind of coming with a good heart with a long-term relationship, and they're really exploring that. Um, um, this one, this is a beautiful one. You know, this is Alan Franks talking with his daughter, and she wanted to know what it was like to fall in love with her mother, well, for him. So she, she's exploring that with her dad. And of course, these recordings become really important material for their family in years to come. So you're not only, I suppose, able to um, gather a, a, a bunch of recordings together that you can hopefully archive in an institution like the State Library, but you're also gifting back to the community and to those people some sort of document that dignifies their place in the community and dignifies their relationships. 
And that's why we really like this model and that's why we're intending on continuing and, um, and, um, and, and we seem to be still kind of going. Um, so we've worked um, in Bundaberg, uh, we've worked in the Sunshine Coast, uh, we've worked in um, uh, Urella. I'll show you... Um, Show you this one. Um, this is Urella, Camus West End, Talking Fish. Where's Urella? Sound Trails. Next one. Yeah. Okay, so this is an example where we basically hand it back. We, we, we compile a kind of a, a collection of material. This is in Urella, which is down in New England. And we worked really closely with Urella Arts. And basically, at the end of it, we said, there it is. We've got the release forms. We've got photographs, beautiful photographs of all the people who come in. We've got professional recorded material. Everybody's got a CD. We've given them back a recording of what we've done. And then we basically then hand that entire collection back to that community. We keep it, obviously, in our um, archive. But we hand that back to the community and we encourage them to do something with that. And this is what um, the Urala community has kind of done. So here um, you've got some people who have come in together, some people have come um, on their own. Generally people have come in on their, uh, together. Um, and um, basically you can go in here and you can play these um, recordings. We also cut up um, uh, material. Uh, so from each of these recordings we usually cut about a three minute piece out of them uh, which, which showcases something from the conversation and we offered them to local ABC radio. So local ABC radio over summer played every single one of these conversations. Uh, and I have to say we've had very strong uptake from ABC local radio. ABC local radio really want content and if you're able to provide them something like, um, uh, you know, some beautiful cameo moments, you know, where these people are coming together. It, it, you're kind of giving them their brief. You're giving them local content. You're giving them local voices, and they want to support that. So I think they're, uh, they've been real champions for stuff that we've been working on. Um, but I guess the other thing is, is what you're doing here is you're not only recording material but you're dignifying the relationships that underpin an entire community here. You know? These three fellas here, you know, the, their relationship that they have is, is just fundamental to kind of the, the marrow of that community. They're, they're keepers of, of all sorts of things and so you're kind of saying, we want to bring you together because we recognise and respect your relationship, your wisdom, but we want to document this as part of you know, a living kind of history of the community. So as you can probably tell, I'm quite passionate about this model of, of, of recording. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I love the traditional model of oral history. I think it's this, there's definite advantages of the traditional model of oral history. I think you can go a lot longer. We, we only do 40 minutes here with this one. Uh, and also, um, we do no background research on this. People come with their own topics. Uh, in Urala, the community actually sourced a lot of their people who came in. So they went, we know that those guys are important. We want them to come in. So we sort of invited the community to play that role. Um, Okay, so um, I'll give you an example here of where sort of my work as an artist kind of intersects a little bit with my work as um, a radio producer and I would say less so as an oral historian. And what I want to do here is I just want to focus on, for me, the importance of voice because all of this material we're talking about is oral. It's all spoken. And, and within these recordings, you've not only got a kind of document of the voice and the facts and the, the history, but you've got their relationships. 
and their context to place. You've got background sounds. And, and so I'm, I'm really interested, I suppose, as, um, as someone who works in this field, to, as to the kind of how sound is often overlooked today. And, 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 and in the digital technology, people are often kind of getting quite carried away with kind of digital stories. So what I have kind of got involved in in the last few years is, is, is basically saying, well, I'm going to give these digital stories a go, but I'm not going to make um, the image the primary kind of mover. I'm going to keep the sound uh, as, as sort of, you know, an important element here. So I'll just um, see if I can find it. Next my song here. Um, so this was a piece I did uh, with um, Into the Music, which is for Radio National. And um, uh, I worked with this beautiful man uh, who lives in Kinkin, uh, who's really quite a, a sort of a, an eccentric genius. Uh, and he, um, he's a blacksmith. Um, but I'll, you, you'll get a little bit of an idea as to kind of how I'm, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I hope, sort of prefacing sound in this. <laughs> Your world unfolding. And many years ago, I had the experience of grinding with an angle grinder on a big complex steel form. And started to hear a celestial melody. I also realized that as I moved my grinding disc around on the surface, I could find sweet spots that caused this melody to play stronger. I had about six or eight blokes working around me and I made them all stop. And I introduced them to it and I played a performance on this angle grinder for them. One of the guys pointed out to me, when you find and activate that tone over there, this window starts to really rattle we found that other tones would make the roofing iron on the shed vibrate. We then had this background noise of the rain falling on the roof and the downpipes started to sing. And this perception that had been awakened was saying, listen in to the sound of the downpipe. Listen in to the sound of the tin on the roof. Listen in to the sound with the angle grinder. And we started to be aware that somehow one sound seemed to be communicating to every other sound and they were playing in concert. Where are we? Well, we're sitting on my back veranda and um, we're on the eastern entry into the Kinkin village. So this is the Noosa River catchment area. We're in amongst rolling hills with gum trees and with cattle walking around. And, uh, and there are a number of sculptures in the garden. What's going on here? Well, I have a great fascination with vibration. <laughs> fingers on steel bars. 
us. So that's um a piece that I did, and he's just a charismatic man. He's got a beautiful voice, which is really important for me. Um, the sound of people's voices, I, I really kind of tune into them. Um, okay, so the last thing that um, I want to touch on, which is what's been obsessing me for the last um, year, year and a half, <clears throat> um, uh, along with the story project and along with working as an oral historian, is a project which we're um, in the sort of last couple of months putting together. Uh, and it's called Sound Trails. And I'm just going to see if I can bring it up. Here. Which one? That one? There. Um, sound Trails. Um, now, it, this is sort of moving things for me through to a new level. Uh, and it, um, the project that we did with Urella, we got release forms from everyone who was involved. Um, to be able to use the material for non-commercial purposes, educative purposes. So we're able to gift material if we want to, to libraries, but we're also able to make material available to showcase, say for instance, in the ABC. So we had this kind of primary um, bed of audio material, beautiful conversations, recorded material. And then meanwhile, what happened is that technology started to move along. And can you chuck me my mobile phone, house? And I was very, very conscious of um, the way in which um, uh, um, GPS allows you to walk into certain locations. And it, when you walk into a certain location, then basically, um, GPS will activate and, and something happens. Uh, so, you know, on your Navman or um, uh, I'm not sure what they're, what they're also called, but, you know, you, you've got the map that you follow when you're driving, say, from, you know, somewhere to an unknown destination. The map follows you. Well, basically, um, what we've put together is we've put together an app, uh, which is called Sound Trails. Um, and um, we're in the last, you probably can't see it, but you can see the little kind of icon and stuff there. Now, we're launching on August the 30th and we're launching in three locations. We're launching at the Mile Creek Massacre site down in New South Wales. We're launching in Urella and we're launching in a tiny wee tin pot town called Warrialda, which is about 30 kilometres north of Mile Creek. And actually, there's quite a lot of parallels between Warrialda and Mile Creek. So what I'm doing is I'm working as a sound producer slash oral historian. And I'm running around and I'm recording material and I'm working with the communities and I'm putting together a range of stories that reflect those places. So here, for instance, in Mile Creek, I've been working really closely with uh, a group of people who are the descendants of the perpetrators and the descendants of the victims of the Mile Creek Massacre. Uh, and um, I've recorded um, a number of kind of uh, recordings. Uh, uh, these will, most of these will be lodged with the State Library of New South Wales. Uh, I've also been gathering extra material, uh, working with um, researchers, uh, some writers. But it's primarily about, for me, engaging the public. So the Mile Creek Massacre site, I'm not sure if you're aware of the story, um, and, and, and every place is different that we're going to work at. So Urala has a very different kind of blueprint than Warri Elder has a different blueprint than the Mile Creek Massacre. The Mile Creek Massacre sound walk, sound trail, as we're calling it, um, is, is quite a complex one because it comes with a whole lot of politics and history and, and the stories are complex. And, and it also brings up, I have to say, within sort of the collective Australian psyche, a sort of a, a, a great deal of sort of soul searching, the story. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful place. So what we're able to do now with technology is we're able to animate 
this space with stories. Now, I see my job not so much is to kind of, um, uh, I, I see my job as kind of almost like a kind of a, a, a um, to, to, to basically kind of hear all these stories and work with the community and then sort of feed them back in ways that are going to engage people. So um, you've got... The beginning of the trail here, where people pull in the car park, and you've got the end of the trail here, and you can see we're going to change this map that's going to come here. That's the, the memorial, the stone memorial. So... Um, uh, on Sunday, uh, on June 8, I think it is, June 8, um, every year, they have an annual gathering, and in two days' time, uh, there'll probably be about two, three, four hundred people will be meeting here. And they'll actually be, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll get it together. Um, a lot of them will be able to walk down the track using mobile phones with GPS where they can walk in and out of the stories. Those stories will fade up when they walk into a certain location. The stories will play if they want to walk out, they can walk out. If they want to walk into another story, that story will kick in. Everything is tailored according to GPS. And of course, here, how do you place stories across landscape here? I mean, this is a really interesting kind of question, I think, today, especially in a place so powerful as the Mile Creek site, because you've got people, I would argue, who are coming here to the site, and they've got an open heart. They've generally got an open heart. Mile Creek's way the hell out of anywhere, you know? It's miles away. If you're going to come out here, you're going to have to have a reason, and you're going to have to know something about the story or, 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 or have some sort of empathy, I think, with what's going on. So um, crafting those stories so that they sort of move people through a number of stages has been a really interesting journey for me. Um, and, and right from the start I said, I cannot tell the definitive story. I am not the authority here. What I can do is I can create a range of stories that will provoke, that will excite, that will speak to people, and that will hopefully better inform them about the Mile Creek massacre and how it's still sort of um, rippling out today. And that's what I've been involved in here in Mile Creek and Urella and Warrielda. So we've worked with developers now for the last nine months, and they've been building this platform, and it's called Sound Trails. And we're basically guns for hire across Australia. And that means that basically once we've finished this, and this is going to work, it's going to be beautiful. Um, the maps are going to be a lot sort of more embellished. You can expand it. Um, um, and we basically will be open to different uh, places, especially regional places, because regional places are just off the map. They're not even, they're not even on the map. You know, a town like Warrielda, you know, half of them, they, they, they'll know as soon as, as soon as kind of old Jeanette Wilson, who's the undertaker's daughter, as soon as she walks down the main street of, of Warrielda and she hears her voice in that story, which I planted outside the old undertaker's house, as soon as she hears that, it's all going to make sense. The digital age will start to make sense to her. But if I try and explain to Jeanette Wilson, what an app is and how GPS works. I mean, she's in her 80s. It, it, it goes over her head. But she understands the significance of preserving stories. She doesn't understand quite yet, I think, that these stories are being well produced by, you know, by producers who actually know how to handle sound. But I guess one of the things which is just lovely for me is that Urella and Warrielda particularly, are regional communities who just would not even know how to apply for an arts grant um, it, it, for something like this, for something like this. And so um, the, the Mile Creek Sound Walk, I, I feel, will probably get quite a bit of interest, uh, possibly in Australia and possibly overseas, um, because they're animating landscape and they're bringing in things like social history and voices and they're playing that to people right on that spot. And if someone's got high quality headphones 
and they're walking down that sound trail, it's going to be quite a powerful experience for them. And I think that's, that's my job. That's my job as someone who's worked with people recording. That's my job as a producer. And that's what I like. I want to hear places animated. You know, I, I like sounds. I like voices. I, there's, some, there's something uh, that speaks to my gut, that speaks to my heart when I hear people's voices. And they're genuine. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of a very... <laughs> Quick kind of overview, yeah. Um, I'm interested in the um, copyright of the recordings. Um, does the do the interviewees um, own their stories, or is is it the interviewer or the project? And what about especially some of the indigenous stories? Well, the, with something like the Mile Creek Massacre site, for example, I was invited by the Friends of the Mile Creek um, to, to do this. So I think that, that that was important. It wasn't like I was kind of coming to them. Um, they, they, they have a, a mission statement almost, is to, to best educate and inform people around this extraordinary story. Uh, you know, and, and, and the Mile Creek stands in for hundreds of other massacre sites around Australia, but that's the only recognised site in Australia. So um, uh, I ask everyone to sign a release form when I work with them. Um, and I've worked with a whole raft of people, I think, in the Mile Creek, uh, saying I've probably worked with probably, f I've ran probably about 40 people, musicians, actors, uh, indigenous people, um, uh, descendants of the perpetrators, uh, academics, and everyone signs a release form. And that's to the story project. And the story project basically um, uh, has then, they have a five day cooling off period. Uh, and I mean, for the details of kind of the release form, I can, I can ask Hals if you want, do you want to talk? I might just Yeah. <coughs> Hi, I'm Helen. I'm the other half of the story project. <laughs> He's the other half too. Um, and I, I might just jump in on the copyright um, aspect. So we've set the release form up so that um, people are signing copyright of the recording to the story project organisation. And then we licence um, to, if, if it's going to archives or to, for broadcast, we licence for non-exclusive, non-commercial use of those recordings. And generally, we give people um, a copy of the recording as well that they can use in any way they choose in a non-commercial way. Um, so that's generally the way that we we cover it. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, we we spent quite a long time on our release form. Actually, it was quite a complex process, um, but it, it was interesting because I noticed with things like the National Library. Um, or say, for instance, with Talking Fish when I was working with the university, that the release forms can often be really prohibitive. Um, and so we've basically just got a two-sided form. And, and it says yes or no. Um, and and, and we, we, we give them a five-day calling off period. Um, and, you know, it, it, the, the, the front side of it's fairly straightforward. The back side of it's actually quite, you know, the detail. and. Um, I mean, they're, they're a little bit kind of confronting, you know, when you see that you hand over moral ownership. Is that what we... It's, I mean, what a, what a term, you know. I'm handing over all my moral ownership to you. <laughs> but we have to be very careful, too, with the story project, if we put stuff out there, that we don't get sued for defamation. Um, we, you know, we're a tiny wee company. We're a tiny wee not-for-profit company. So if someone goes and says something which we then broadcast and someone sues us, I mean, we're down straight away. So we've got to be very careful with that release form. Um, but it's funny because if I, come, if, I, if I put my radio producer's hat on, I would then sort of also say that, hey, the, the release form's really important and I understand why it's there, but by the same token, if I'm working as a radio producer, by rights with the ABC, what I do is I say to someone, I am recording this for this purpose, 
this is what I understand will happen with this. Do you give my, your consent for me to use this? Um, and, and there's a certain element of trust that's there. And I think one of the difficulties is with the release form is that you've developed this trust with this person and then, you know, you're getting along really well with them and you're about to head out and, oh, by the way, could you sign this, please? You know, and there's this great big kind of, you know, technical document. It's kind of a funny moment. Yeah. I think um, some of the challenges I think that we're facing and I think others in the room are is that now if we go and do an oral history project we can begin with all of the processes you know in place or worked out it's those retrospective issues that many of us are finding challenging but yeah that's uh, good morning I just wanted to ask a question does the fear of defamation um, do the uh, are the stories from the indigenous group are they um, edited to be more subtle and more for radio uh, or for such projects and does the the, the um, I guess the true impact of all those stories get out there to uh, the other to external people yeah um, real stories of the indigenous yeah. of the massacre within the community is it the are they more subtle versions or um, were you referring to like recordings with the indigenous people? That's um, right. I think Mile Creek's an interesting one because it, it's like, I mean, it's like I'm operating within a wound. The Mile Creek story is like a wound. It's like a wound within the collective Australian psyche. I mean, some people are even saying, and, I, and, I, and a part of me agrees with this, the Mile Creek site is the prism through which you can kind of read Australian race relations. It's, it's an extremely potent place here. It's the only federally heritage listed massacre site in Australia. It's the only one which has actually got court transcripts, documentation that goes right back to that time. So it's, it's, a, it's, there, there's, there, it's, a, it's a complex process with the Mile Creek one. Whereas, for instance, when I was interviewing Indigenous people, say, for Talking Fish, um, you know, I was interviewing, I can remember interviewing a, a beautiful um, old couple from Lightning Ridge uh, about their connection with the river at the mission and, and, and the fish that they would catch and, and, um, and, 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 and how important that river was to their people. Um, there, there, was a, there was a real beauty with that. You know, there was a real love of, um, of what they were sharing with me. And I, I, I didn't have any problems there. Um, I actually think that by the time I've come along here, you know, uh, a white fella coming along, um, and I've come along, I think people have done a lot of that hard processing beforehand. So by the time I'm interviewing, you know, Arnie Sue Blacklock or, or Uncle Lyle, you know, they've told this story many times to me. They've told the story many times to other people. They've told the story in Australian stories and so on and so forth. I've, I, I, to be really honest with you, I actually think that, that you know, um, the three primary elders with this um, situation, um, they're probably almost more at peace with this than a lot of the white people. <laughs> the white people are the ones who really are soul searching here. Um, and, um, um, you know, especially if you discover, for instance, that your great-great-grandfather was the one who decapitated 28 people, um, you know, take, cutting off their arms and heads and so on and so forth. Um, you know, what's that kind of mean for us? Um, so I, I've never for, for a moment felt that I had to play any sort of censoring role with the recordings that I've had with the Indigenous people with this. But by the same token, I'm not interested in creating unnecessary controversy around this site. I see my job in some ways to positively and constructively reflect these places through a range of sound stories that engage people uh, and that um, to dignify the community and, and the people. So it's, it's really not been an issue for me on that one, yeah. I think with some of the white people it has been, 
Yeah. Right. Any more questions, comments? I think we've got the rest of the day to keep going. So people could really thank Hamish for coming and.